Welcome. This is a new opportunity of professional study, this time with the US lawyers and judges. I don't want to steal precious time, and I immediately pass the floor to the president of the Rome Bar Association, Mr. Antonino Galletti. Antonino, a te la parola, prego. Microfono per cortesia, microfono per cortesia, grazie. Grazie, good morning. As president of the Order of Lawyers of Rome, I address a warm welcome to all the attendants. Mm -hmm. On behalf of Roman lawyers, I am honored to host such distinguished speakers from Hartford. As some of you maybe know, today is the first of two webinars on the legal profession in Italy and Connecticut. Today, the speakers from Hartford will talk to our lawyers here in Rome. We are on February 24, our speakers from Rome will talk to American lawyers in Connecticut. It's maybe the first time ever that the two bar associations from two different countries organize a double event of such a kind. I thank Francesco Salimbeni for realizing this project. We are very proud of this cooperation and we aim to extend it to other projects. First of all, promoting an exchange program, organizing internship of young lawyers in Connecticut and in Rome. We believe in, in internationalization of legal profession. We believe in the friendship between the Rome lawyers and the colleagues from Hartford Country Bar Association, that is the oldest in the United States. And I sent a warm, warm greeting to its president, Tom Rankin. We look forward to celebrate our cooperation in presence as soon as the pandemic will allow it. Let me finish this welcome remarks in Italian. Benvenuti ai nostri eh, ospiti, eh, grazie per la collaborazione con l'Ordine di Hartford del, nel Connecticut, che è l'ordine più antico degli Stati Uniti d'America. È un onore per noi iniziare questa collaborazione reciproca. Saluto il Presidente Thomas Recken e saluto tutti gli ospiti collegati, in particolare il giudice Nardini, che eh, è un giudice che della Corte federale, di una delle corti federali di appello. Negli Stati Uniti ci sono 350 milioni di abitanti, ma ci sono soltanto tre corti federali di appello e lui è il giudice di una di queste corti. Al grado più alto c'è la, la eh, Corte eh, Suprema di Washington, che è la loro corte costituzionale, composta dai nuovi giudici che sono in carica a vita. Quindi eh, gli auguriamo anche maggiori successi. Intanto vi do la buona notizia che il giudice Nardini, avendo studiato qui a Roma la Sapienza nel 90 e nel 91, tenterà di fare il suo intervento in lingua italiana. E quindi lo ringrazio doppiamente anche per l'impegno e lo sforzo di parlare nella nostra lingua. Il 24 di febbraio noi invece faremo un evento dove parleremo per i colleghi di Hartford e quindi ci scambieremo queste reciproche e cortesie diciamo formative nel frattempo abbiamo anche organizzato a beneficio dei nostri giovani degli incontri culturali di scambio per cui i nostri giovani andranno, potranno fare dei percorsi di pratica forense presso di loro e viceversa ovviamente questo sarà possibile quando, partirà la, quando finirà la pandemia grazie thanks president the floor uh, the colleague P.J. Simini, moderator of the event on the U.S. side. Grazie. Buon pomeriggio a tutti amici. My name is P.J. Cimini. I'm an attorney in Hartford, Connecticut, and a member of the Hartford County Bar Association, the oldest in the United States, and I'm also a very proud son of Italian immigrants here. I welcome you all to this very important gathering and educational event. All of us here in Connecticut 
are very excited about this collaboration. This idea was first born and the concept came about through my professional and personal relationship with Avvocato Francesco Salambini. Uh, he has been a strong advocate and proponent of the Rome Bar and the connections between you and our Bar Association. And over the years, we have worked together on many issues of law and business, and it was through his drive and determination that this wonderful partnership came to be. Uh, there is a very strong and deep history between Italy and Connecticut. Among all the states in the, in the U.S., Connecticut has the largest number of Italian roots, individuals with Italian history. Today, we begin this exciting new chapter of a partnership that will grow in the future, and that one that I truly believe will create many new friendships, legal partnerships, and many business development and economic development benefits. This will ensure this continuing relationship between Connecticut and Italy. So I thank you and I thank uh, Francesco, President Galetti, and others. Grazie. Thanks, PJ. <clears throat> Today is the official beginning of our cooperation, and I'm very proud of it. Let me thank uh, all the distinguished speakers and all the friends and colleagues who cooperated in realizing this project. First of all, PJ, who believe in it uh, since the beginning. Then Tom Rechen, Ed Heat, Jenny Sambruso, and of course, Andrea Pontecorbo and our president, Antonio Galetti, who always supported me. I'd like also to thank two other people that are not here, but maybe will watch us from Hartford. I mean, Quintino Cianfaglione, the honorary consul of Italy in the state of Connecticut, and Joe Mioli, former representative at the house in Hartford. I just add that I'm very happy about today's event that they re enrich our bar associations. This double webinar aim to enforce our cooperation that I'm sure will be enduring and fruitful. So now, let me introduce the first speaker, who is uh, Honorable Justice Doria, who is a Connecticut native. Justice Doria was sworn in as an Associate Justice on March 8, 2017. Prior to his appointment to the Supreme Court, he had worked in the office of the Attorney General for over 23 years in a variety of roles. Justice Doria had served as Connecticut First Solicitor General, appointed to that position by Attorney General George Epson in 2011. In 2009, he was nominated and inducted as a fellow into the American Academy of Appellate Lawyers, a distinguished national organization that works to advance the administration of justice and promote the highest standards of professionalism and advocacy in appellate courts. Justice Doria was also founding director of the Connecticut Supreme Court Historical Society. I give the word to Justice Doria. I give you the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Grazie e benvenute. Uh, I'm so pleased to be with you all today. I'm so pleased to welcome you all gathered in Rome to this program in Hartford. Uh, as introduced, I am Greg Doria. I'm an associate justice on the Connecticut Supreme Court, and our courthouse is located in Hartford. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my position in our judicial system, a little bit about me personally, and how I feel a, a great connection to this joint venture. Uh, judges in my position are nominated by the governor of our state and confirmed by our legislature to an eight-year term. Uh, I'm nearly four years into my first term. Uh, to continue service after eight years, I have to be reappointed by the governor and reconfirmed by our legislature. Uh, and by our state constitution, uh, we have a mandatory retirement age of 70. So I have a little more than 12 years to go if I, if I do the whole time. Uh, Judge Nardini after me is going to uh, speak about our federal system. He and I are both 
appellate level judges, Judge Nardini in the federal system and I in the state system. After Judge Nardini, Judge Bazzuto will discuss our state court system here in the state of Connecticut. She and I are both state court judges, Judge Bazzuto at the trial level and I at the appellate level. So that's a little bit about who I am and what I do professionally. Uh, now I'll, I'll tell you a little about me personally and how I feel connection to this program. And I should get this out of the way first because many of you must be looking at me even over the internet and saying, who invited this Irish guy to come talk to us? Uh, and I can tell you that was the reaction too when my wife first introduced me to her family. My wife, uh, Joan, grew up in a family with a great deal of Italian heritage. She comes from the south end of Hartford, which when she was growing up was very much the Italian section of Hartford. So when they heard my last name of the 20 year old kid that she was bringing home, uh, their spirits soared and then they saw me and uh, there was great disappointment. Um, so uh, it's, it's true that I am three quarters Irish. Three of my uh, four grandparents are Irish. It's my father's father that was from a family that came over in, from Italy and settled here. But my grandmother, Nana Doria, an Irish woman who married an Italian man back in the early 1900s, used to say, you are whatever your father is. So my father was one half Italian, one half Irish. So he was Italian. Uh, I was and am three quarters Irish, one quarter Italian. So I'm Italian. Italian defies, I guess, all genetic and mathematic properties. So I certainly grew up believing I was Italian and, uh, and feel it now. And it was certainly uh, my Italian ancestors I heard more about than anyone on my mother's side or on my father's mother's side. Uh, my great-grandfather, Salvatore Doria, emigrated in the 1880s from the town of Capasela in the province of Avellino. He settled in New York, Newark, New Jersey with his new bride and he raised his family. He was a stonemason by trade, uh, but in the US he began a steamship a ticket agency, mainly assisting immigrants coming from the US, coming to the US from Italy. And because in that business, he was often entrusted with other people's money as part of his business taking payments to assure safe passage. Many of the new immigrants from Italy also often entrusted him with other sums of money and he would convert US dollars into Italian currency to be sent back to families at home in Italy. This eventually uh, led him to establish a bank in Newark, the, the Doria Bank and Trust. And the bank grew and he brought his sons into the business and by the mid 1920s, the Doria Bank and Trust had expanded to open a branch in Naples, Italy. Now with the 1930s came the Great Depression, which ultimately led to both Doria banks, as well as many smaller banks closing due, due to insolvency. But I relate all of this to you because like all of you, I assume, I see the great value in the relationship between our organizations being that we find some common interests common experiences, common commitments, or perhaps even relations. Uh, if any of you listening to me today have ever heard of the Doria Bank and Trust from a century ago or know anyone who has, perhaps I'll hear from you and I'll have made a friend or found a relative. If not, you'll still learn from all of us speaking to you today that we are all alike in so many ways. We raise our families and serve our communities. We approach our roles as lawyers and judges with a deep commitment to the rule of law. And in these very uncertain times, it's these shared values that make the relationship between these two organizations so important, so worthwhile. And so uh, I hope you'll enjoy the webinar today. And I look forward to a time when we can meet one another in person here in Connecticut or there in Rome. So thank you and welcome. Thank you, Justice Doria, uh, for this welcome and also for sharing uh, the story of your roots uh, with us. 
Um, now I'm very honored to give the floor to Judge Nardini. As you heard before, Judge Nardini was appointed to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit in 2019. Um, introducing him, I could uh, mention many things, but uh, uh, I'd like to say something of, about his relations with Italy. Uh, Judge Nardini attended the European University Institute in Fiesole, Italy, where in 1998 he earned an LLM in European and Comparative and International Law. He was then a consultant for the Italian Constitutional Court, where he briefed the Italian justices on development in American constitutional law and researched Italian constitutional law. He was also posted overseas at the U.S. Embassy in Rome as the Department of Justice attaché representing the United States in all criminal justice matters involving Italy. I think he will also talk about the federal court system in the United States, so I definitely give him the floor. Thank you, Judge Nardini. Thank you, Judge Nardini. Grazie, Avvocato Salambeni, e voglio anche ringraziare l'Avvocato Galetti per averci invitato a questo bel uh, seminario. Um, come i nostri colleghi a Hartford, siamo molto contenti di cominciare questa collaborazione internazionale. Speriamo che sia una collaborazione che duri per molti anni e che sia molto proficua. Io sono stato incaricato per spiegarvi un pochettino del nostro sistema federale e quindi comincio eh, dal punto eh, che ha fatto il collega giudice Dauria eh, sul fatto che noi negli Stati Uniti abbiamo un sistema doppio, un sistema federale e cioè potete pensare che c'è un piramide di corti, di tribunali, cominciando con i tribunali inferiori, poi procedendo ai corti di appello e poi alla Corte Suprema. Però dovete immaginare che ci sia, che, che ci sia un piramide del genere in ogni Stato, in ogni singolo Stato degli Stati Uniti, più il distretto di Colombia, quindi ne abbiamo 51 di questi piramidi uno per ciascun Stato, e poi in più abbiamo un altro piramide completamente separato a livello federale. Io vi parlo di questo sistema federale. Allora, cominciamo dal base. Abbiamo suddiviso il territorio americano in 94 distretti. Ognuno ha un, un tribunale federale per gli stati abbastanza piccoli come Connecticut, tutto lo stato del Connecticut è coperto da un singolo tribunale federale, mentre invece gli stati più grandi, per esempio California, Texas, New York, vengono suddivisi in quattro, ci sono quattro distretti. Poi questi distretti sono raggruppati in quello che chiamiamo circuiti, io sono un giudice sulla Corte d'Appello per il secondo circuito che ricopre i distretti, i vari distretti di, con tribunale che si trovano sia a New York, sia nel Connecticut, sia nello stato di Vermont. Quindi il nostro circuito ha la competenza di sentire gli appelli che vengono da sei tribunali distrettuali in quei tre stati, però sempre tribunale federale. Poi procedendo uh, su, se uno vuole fare ricorso contro una sentenza della Corte d'Appello, bisogna andare alla Corte Suprema Washington. E quando dico Corte Suprema di Washington, quello di cui si legge spesso sui giornali, stiamo parlando della Corte Suprema federale, che sarebbe un'altra cosa diversa dalla Corte Suprema, per esempio, su cui uh, lavora il collega uh, Giulio Doria, che lavora sulla Corte Suprema dello Stato di Connecticut. Quindi, in questo sistema federale abbiamo questa piramide, 
cominciando dai tribunali che sono 94, ehm, presieduto da vari giudici monocratici, e poi quando si arriva alla Corte d'Appello, per esempio il secondo circuito, noi siamo in 13 giudici, però lavoriamo in collegi di tre giudici ciascuno. Non siamo suddivisi in sezioni e quindi forse lunedì ci sarà un gruppo di tre e poi martedì saremo un altro tre e non si sa mai però noi siamo una tredicina di giudici sul secondo circuito, mentre invece quando si arriva alla Corte Suprema degli Stati Uniti sono nuovi giudici che, sentono, che decidono tutti i casi sempre eh, nel collegio di nove giudici. Come ha accennato eh, giudice Doria, tutti i giudici federali, compreso io, siamo di nomina del... Presidente degli Stati Uniti, della Casa Bianca, però dobbiamo essere confermati dal Senato. E quindi una volta che noi siamo confermati, noi abbiamo l'incarico per vita, quindi non possiamo essere licenziati, non possiamo essere buttati via e non possiamo essere messi o mandati ad altri tribunali. Quindi è una cosa importante è capire che noi non abbiamo la carriera di giudice, quindi io ho fatto carriera eh, personalmente come procuratore, come pubblico ministero, facendo pubblico ministero per più o meno 20 anni. Ci sono altri giudici che hanno fatto varie altre cose, difensore, eh, avvocato privato, però una volta che noi veniamo confermati dal Senato abbiamo questo incarico su una corte, un tribunale particolare. Quindi non è che si comincia su un tribunale inferiore e poi si avanza la carriera cambiando incarico. Eh, ci può essere il caso che uno viene eh, selezionato come giudice su un tribunale inferiore e poi dopo il giro di anni viene nominato da presidente per un altro incarico. Però non, per, per esempio io non posso essere promosso, per così dire, alla Corte Suprema non abbiamo un consiglio, un consiglio superiore della magistratura, in effetti. Uh, io ho questo incarico e rimango qua sulla Corte d'Appello, punto e basta. Non c'è un concorso, uh, c'è un questo semplice nomina e, e poi siamo lì. Quindi passo per un attimino adesso per, per parlare un po' più uh, della funzione dei nostri tribunali corti Federali e le nostre competenze. Per capire meglio le differenze tra i nostri tribunali e il sistema che esiste in Italia, devo dire che per esempio noi abbiamo la competenza, e questo vale anche per i tribunali dei singoli stati, abbiamo le competenze sia in materia penale sia in materia civile. Quindi non c'è non ci sono eh, diverse sezioni. Noi, eh, per esempio, eh, la settimana scorsa io ho sentito dei ricorsi eh, a alcuni penali e alcuni civili. La stessa cosa vale anche per la giurisprudenza, la giurisdizione amministrativa. Non abbiamo una struttura separata per la, giuris la giurisdizione amministrativa, non esistono i TAR, non esiste il Consiglio di Stato, mentre invece tutti quei ricorsi, tutti quei casi, azioni, cominciano presso i, o i tribunali federali eh, inferiori, ci sono alcuni che cominciano direttamente presso la Corte d'Appello federale e poi procedono alla Corte Suprema invece di un Consiglio di Stato. <coughs> E poi, come dicevo, non abbiamo le sezioni né alla Corte Suprema né presso le corti d'appello. Quindi io sono più o meno un generalista, devo capire un po' sia del diritto penale, sia del diritto civile, sia del diritto amministrativo. E la cosa importante è anche per capire la differenza tra un corte d'appello negli Stati Uniti e una corte d'appello in Italia e non noi negli Stati Uniti non abbiamo il doppio livello di giurisdizione 
Quindi io come giudice della Corte d'Appello non entro nel merito del caso, ma quello che facciamo, come lavoriamo, come noi consideriamo un ricorso, è più o meno, più o meno paragonabile a quello che succede da voi presso la Corte di Cassazione. E questo è una, un, un fatto molto importante, perché per capire meglio, io... Eh, Paragone non è proprio esatto, però quello che fa le corti d'appello negli Stati Uniti è più paragonabile a quello che succede presso la corte di Cassazione e poi quello che succede presso la nostra corte suprema è molto più paragonabile a quello che succede davanti alle Stazioni Unite della corte di Cassazione. E poi un, un fatto che è molto importante è che non si può fare ricorso come diritto presso la Corte Suprema degli Stati Uniti. Quindi quasi tutti i ricorsi finiscono da me, finiscono al mio livello, dico, eh, davanti alla Corte d'Appello. Quindi uno che perde davanti al Tribunale può fare ricorso alla Corte d'Appello ehm, e quindi noi dobbiamo per forza considerare quella, quel ricorso, però devono chiedere alla Corte Suprema successivamente di sentire il ricorso e loro a Washington fanno selezione, hanno una competenza completamente discrezionale e loro scelgono al massimo 100 casi per anno, 100 casi all'anno e basta. E quindi tutto il resto, più o meno 9.000 ricorsi che vengono fatti, richieste che vengono fatti per un writ di certiorari, come diciamo nel nostro latino macaronico, eh, quelle richieste vanno rispinte dalla Corte Suprema. Quindi praticamente la fine della storia è con noi presso le Corti d'Appello. Quindi è molto importante capire che da noi la Corte Suprema degli Stati Uniti è più o meno una combinazione della Corte di Cassazione, eh, il Consiglio di Stato, Corte di Conte e anche la Corte Costituzionale, però anche in questo senso da noi una, una questione di costituzionalità di una legge, la responsabilità per ehm, giudicare quella, quella questione è diffusa, quindi non è concentrato nella Corte Suprema degli Stati Uniti, ogni giudice anche a livello più basso ha il potere di pronunciare sulla costituzionalità di una legge. Ovviamente può essere uh, rivista dalla Corte d'Appello e poi eventualmente anche dalla Corte Suprema degli Stati Uniti. Ma questo è un punto molto importante, quindi non abbiamo questo sistema in cui la questione viene mandata anche da un, un giudice di basso livello ad una Corte centralizzata. Um, nella maggior parte dei casi la questione di costituzionalità eh, rimane presso il giudice monocratico, viene rivisto dalla Corte d'Appello collegiale e poi eventualmente, però spesso no, viene rivisto anche dalla Corte Suprema. Quindi adesso ecco, vi lascio eh, con, questo, con questi cenni molto superficiali, confesso, Um, su come funziona il nostro sistema federale per darvi un'idea almeno delle differenze che esistono tra i nostri due sistemi e poi eh, quando sentite dal collega eh, Giuseppe Buzzutto sentirete un po' come funziona il sistema dei singoli stati eh, per cui l'esemplare oggi sarà quel sistema che noi abbiamo nel singolo stato di Connecticut quindi Uh, di nuovo vi ringrazio uh, molto per questo bel invito, vi ringrazio per la collaborazione e vi auguro un buon lavoro. Grazie, thanks uh, Giorgio Nardini for this uh, impressive uh, lecture and that um, also give us some um, opportunity to reflect uh, and to think about some element, in my opinion, that we could maybe import uh, in Italy you know, on some, uh, under such profiles. 
So I, I now introduce uh, Honorable Elizabeth Bozuto. The Honorable Elizabeth Bozuto is a Superior Court judge first appointed by Governor John G. Rowland in 2000. She's currently serving as the Deputy Chief Court Administrator. And previously, Judge Bazuto was admitted to the State of Connecticut Bar in 1988, the U.S. District Court, District of Connecticut in 1989, and the U.S. Court of Appeals Second Circuit in 1992. Prior to her appointment to the Superior Court, Judge Bozuto was a practicing attorney. Judge Bozuto specialized in civil litigation with an emphasis on insurance, defense, and family law. I give you the floor, Judge Bozuto. Well, thank you, and uh, greetings, Italy. I'm going to do my best to speak slowly, as Francesco uh, advised us, but I do have a tendency to speak quickly. And before I start um, to talk with you about the Connecticut court structure, I thought I'd let you know that I am a very proud Italian-American uh, and rightly or wrongly consider myself 100% Italian in that my grandparents um, on both sides, my mom and dad, came from Italy. Uh, my grandfather, uh, John Bazzuto, came from Foggia. Italy in 1906 is a very young man uh, with little education and no money and eventually wound up in Waterbury, Connecticut, um, where he sold fruits and vegetables uh, from a cart on the streets in the city. And he raised a large family um, and eventually opened a grocery store that eventually turned into a wholesale grocery market. And I'm very proud uh, to say that that business still exists today. It's a very, very large grocery wholesale wholesaler up and down the East Coast of Connecticut, still family owned and still goes by the name of Bazzuto's. So I am a very proud Italian American um, and I'm really uh, grateful to have this opportunity to speak with you today. So the um, Connecticut court structure, the state structure um, is unique to the state of Connecticut. As you probably know, we are one of 50 states and each state has their own state structure. Although there are many similarities amongst them. In Connecticut, we have a three tier judicial system. So the very highest tier is our Supreme Court, which Justice Daria sits on. And then we have an appellate court, an intermediate review court. And then we have the trial court, which we call our superior court, uh, which is near and dear to my heart. Um, as was mentioned, I was a trial court judge for 18 years before I became uh, the deputy chief court administrator. So I want to start with a trial court where all jury and non-jury matters are tried. Uh, by statute or by, by law, there are 185 Superior Court judges in Connecticut. Currently, we have close to 50 vacancies. And a little bit later, I'll explain the process uh, for becoming a judge. Connecticut is considered a unified court system, which means that we consolidate otherwise uh, separately run courts. There's no city court, there's no county court. We're all um, one court system, system that's centrally governed under a unified system. And our trial courts and our trial judges are courts and judges of general jurisdiction, which means we cover all matters except for probate. Those things that have to do with wills and estates, that's separate from our court system. So the trial judges hear criminal matters, all state felonies, misdemeanor infractions, 
We hear juvenile matters having to do with children who uh, commit crimes um, or otherwise need the state's protection uh, from parents or other situations. Uh, we hear family matters, which includes divorce, custody, visitation, support, and then of course, all civil matters, which are all, all torts, uh, contracts, land use, zoning, um, and a number of other civil type cases. In Connecticut, we're divided into 13 judicial districts. And amongst those judicial districts across the state, we have 35 courthouses. Now, just to put this in context, uh, the population in Connecticut is somewhere around 3.6 million, uh, which I think is even less than your beautiful, beautiful city of Rome, which I think has about 4 million people. So for that population, um, we have 35 courthouses. We, of course, are open Monday through Friday, nine to five. Before the pandemic, uh, approximately 7 million people were screened throughout each courthouse, throughout all courthouses. Uh, post pandemic in, in 2020, it was significantly reduced. It was still over a million, but nowhere near the numbers that we typically get. Um, a lot of our business that we're doing now is done remotely, just as we're talking on this screen, um, which has reduced significantly the traffic to all of our buildings. We never uh, closed operations or ceased operations um, to this day. We've remained operational. So um, our criminal courts typically process um, 124,000 new cases, and that excludes motor vehicle infractions, which is a large, a large part of the business. And a lot of our motor vehicle infractions are now done virtually. No one has to ever go to court for those. Our juvenile courts uh, process or add new matters, about 21,000 new matters each year. And the family courts, about 30,000 new matters each year. And um, the civil courts, approximately 136,000 new matters each year. So that's the trial court level where really all of the action takes place. All new matters start there. Um, and the next level would be our appellate court, uh, which is an intermediate court and reviews all appeals from the superior court, from the trial court to determine if any errors or mistakes were made. There are nine appellate court judges, one of whom is designated by our chief justice of the Supreme Court to be the chief judge of the appellate court. And generally three judges of the appellate court hear and decide a case. Um, they do sometimes sit on bonk, <clears throat> which means the entire court sits to hear a case, but that's um, at their discretion. And before the pandemic, there were approximately 1,300 new appeals filed each year. And our appellate court is just in one courthouse and it's located in our capital city of Hartford. Our Supreme Court, which Justice Daria sits on, uh, was created in 1784. Um, before that, matters were heard by our General Assembly, our legislator, legislature, our politicians, and uh, that didn't work out well. So they established the Supreme Court, our highest court, and it consists of the Chief Justice, who is currently uh, the Honorable Rick Robertson, the first African-American Chief Justice in the state of Connecticut, six Associate Justices, and one Senior Justice. The Supreme Court reviews rulings or decisions made by the appellate court and some direct appeals right from the trial court, again, to determine whether any mistake may have been made. Um, the Supreme Court can certify lower court decisions for review upon a petition from the aggrieved party or the, the loser, so to speak 
if three justices of the Supreme Court vote for certification. So by way of example, uh, during the Supreme Court term of 2019 to 2020, there were 308 petitions for review or certification, as we call it, that were filed with the Supreme Court, but only 51 were actually granted. The Supreme Court always sits on bank, meaning all seven justices sit in here every single case, um, unless one were disqualified for some reason from not hearing it. And before the pandemic, the Supreme Court added 188 cases to its docket. And of that, 121 were civil or family juvenile and 67 were criminal cases. And again, the Supreme Court is located in Hartford, our capital city, and it's situated right across the street from the state capitol. So how do you become a judge in the state of Connecticut, a state court judge? And the process is the same, whether you are a trial court judge as I was, or an appellate court judge, or even a Supreme Court justice as Justice Doria. So at the very base level in Connecticut to become a judge, you of course have to be a resident of Connecticut. You have to be admitted to the practice of law in the state of Connecticut. And you have to be under the age of 70. As Justice Daria mentioned, uh, in Connecticut, we have a mandatory retirement at age 70 for all state court judges. So if a lawyer meets those basic thresholds, um, you could then submit an application to the Judicial, Judicial Selection Commission if you'd like to be a judge. It's all by application. And the Judicial Selection Commission is the first place you have to go. So that commission is an independent, nonpartisan commission of six lawyers and six non-lawyers appointed by the governor and General Assembly, which is our legislature, uh, to seek and approve qualified candidates for judgeships. And the commission meets once a month, um, except in December, to interview and investigate candidates. So the written application that you have to submit is very lengthy. It seeks all kinds of information, including your schooling, your health, your professional conduct, your employment history, affiliations, community service, your finances, your business associations and partnerships, um, your litigation and non-litigation experience, uh, significant cases you may have handled, the number of jury or non-jury trials you've handled. Uh, additionally, you have to submit the names and contact information for six lawyers you've worked with and an additional six lawyers or judges who know you or your work. And they do call every single one of those people. And also you must submit tax returns, financial affidavits, medical releases, and they also want a general release to get any other information that they may deem necessary to your application. And once that's all submitted to that commission, um, you are interviewed and after the interview, they take a vote. And if you get a majority of the 12, uh, then you move on to the next step. And in 2019, from the Judicial Selection Commission, there were 31 applications. And of those 31 applications, 25 were approved by the commission, five were denied, and one applicant withdrew. So if you are approved by the Judicial Selection Commission, <clears throat> your name is then placed on a list of individuals who are deemed qualified for nomination as a judge. And it's from this list and only this list that the governor of the state of Connecticut, who is the sole appointing authority, may select an attorney for nomination. So you have to be on this list and from that list, the governor may appoint you. And you could be on that list for a month, a year, a decade, or forever, and never get selected. Currently, I believe there are approximately 260 people um, on that list. 
So if you are appointed by the governor, you must then complete another extensive questionnaire and undergo a criminal background investigation. And your name is then submitted to the Judiciary Committee of the General Assembly of our, of our legislature for approval. And the Judici Judiciary Committee has its own questionnaire <clears throat> that must be completed and submitted prior to your appearance before the committee. And at your hearing, your appearance before the Judiciary Committee, each candidate is publicly questioned by the committee, followed by a public hearing on your nomination where anyone from the public could come forward and testify for or against you. And if you are voted favorably out of the Judiciary Committee, you need a majority of those votes, then your nomination goes to the House and Senate of the legislature where both chambers must vote to approve your nomination. And with that final appro approval, uh, the process is complete. And then you are sworn in as a judge. And as Justice Daria mentioned, unlike the federal court system that have lifetime appointment, appointments in the state of Connecticut, the term is good for eight years. And then you have to go through the whole process again. So we are currently awaiting uh, what we think will be the announcement by the governor of 15 or 16 uh, new judges that will fill just some of those 50 vacancies. And um, once they gain approval through the process, they will become judges of the Superior Court and will then have to go through a four-week training period um, that the judicial branch um, offers, and they're all required to participate in that. It's a lot of um, material. They learn all the disciplines from family to criminal to civil to juvenile. They spend some time in the courthouses um, viewing uh, the proceedings and sitting uh, with another judge before they actually uh, take the bench um, themselves. So we anxiously await the announcement from the governor of these new appointees. And um, I think I've taken up all my time and I again thank you for the opportunity and look forward to our further collaboration. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Bazuto. Um, of course, uh, for your speech and also for sharing uh, the story of your roots. Thank you. Uh, now, I am giving the floor to the president of the Hartford County Bar Association, who is Tom Rachin. And let me introduce him to him, to you. Tom is a partner in the Hartford, Connecticut office of McCarter and English LLP. Tom has been practicing law for 33 years in the fields of business and intellectual property litigation. He is recognized by Chambers USA as a leader in the field. He has been elected to the American Board of Trial Advocates, and he is a fellow of the Litigation Council of America. Tom, please. The slide, I think, I think the slides are ready. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Francesco. And uh, thank you, President Galetti. Thank you, uh, all of our new friends uh, in Italy. What an honor uh, it is and has been uh, for me to be president of the Hartford County Bar Association during this historic period. Historic because of this unique collaboration that we are, for the first time, developing uh, between our two bar associations in Rome and here in Hartford County. Absolutely thrilling for me to be a part of this and to be a part of this panel, um, panel of judges, uh, Justice Dioria, Judge Nardini, Judge Bazzuto, and of course my colleagues at the bar, Edward Heath and, uh, and PJ Samini. Uh, a really exciting time uh, for me and I think for our two associations. Uh, I'll give you just a little bit of my ethnic background. 
as you might judge from my last name, I am uh, I have a Ger German history, Austro-Hungarian history. I'm also part Irish, and like Justice Dioria, I am 25% Italian. My grandmother on my father's side came over to this country with her family from Sicily uh, in the very early part of the uh, 20th century, the very early 1900s. My grandmother, Rose Marie Albano, was the 10th of 13 children. And uh, a number of her siblings were much older than she was. Um, she came to this country with her parents. A number of her siblings remained behind in Sicily. And so to this day, I have a family uh, that I have not met, that, uh, that I'm not uh, aware of, unfortunately, that uh, reside uh, in in Sicily, and so that's a little bit about my family's background and my connection to um, to Italy. So my charge here today is to talk a little bit about law firms in the state of Connecticut and the business of the legal profession. So if we go to slide two, which is the first slide. Connecticut law firms are uh, as varied as they could possibly be. There are many different forms, many different firms. Um, every practice area imaginable is practiced by lawyers in the state of Connecticut. Common areas of practice uh, include personal injury and medical malpractice. So if uh, a plaintiff uh, a party is injured by a doctor or in a car accident. Uh, there are lawyers in the personal injury and medical malpractice fields that will handle those cases. Criminal defense is an area where many lawyers practice, representing clients who are charged with crimes. Real estate transactions, whether it be residential real estate or commercial uh, business real estate, uh, Lawyers throughout the state of Connecticut handle these kinds of transactions. Of course, trusts and estates, wills, and matters concerning uh, the elderly are areas of practice for lawyers in the state of Connecticut. Tax, uh, we all have to file our uh, tax returns with the federal and state governments, and accountants uh, typically uh, practice in this area, but there is plenty for lawyers to do as well, representing clients, not just in connection with how they structure uh, their, uh, their tax liabilities, uh, but also in how they prepare their tax returns, and uh, in addition to that, how they deal with the government when they have issues concerning the tax returns that they have filed. And then general business, uh, the general business practice of law. So these are, the, these are the typical areas where you will find many lawyers practicing, but then there are many subspecialties, healthcare, land use, government contracting, uh, importing, exporting, supply chain matters, cybersecurity, and, and so many others. I think it is fair to say that a law degree in the United States prepares a lawyer to pursue almost any area uh, that he or she might want to pursue. And of course, with the advent of technology, uh, there are new and developing areas of the law where lawyers are increasingly focused. If we can go to the next slide. So, Connecticut law firms are of very different sizes. So we're on the, the slide three now. And you will find law firms in Connecticut ranging in size from one lawyer to several hundred lawyers. So I'm with the law firm of McCarter and English. Uh, Ed Heath, who you will hear from in a few moments, uh, is with the law firm of Robinson and Cole. Our, our firms are fairly large firms in Connecticut and in the United States. I think both of our firms have in excess of 200 lawyers. But you will find lawyers in Connecticut practicing by themselves uh, in uh, single lawyer shops. You will find groups of lawyers, 
five or 10 or more firms of 30 or 50 lawyers or much larger firms. You will also find, although our state is relatively small uh, by comparison to some of our neighboring states, New York in particular, um, you will find that many firms have multiple offices in the state of Connecticut. So my uh, firm and Ed's firm, we have offices in Hartford, but uh, we also have offices in Stanford and elsewhere throughout the state. And it's not uncommon uh, for firms, particularly larger firms, to have offices outside of the state. So I'll use my firm as an example. We have offices, uh, 13 offices between Washington, D.C. and Boston, Massachusetts, and uh, all of the major stops in between, Hartford, Stanford, New York City, uh, Newark, New Jersey, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and in Washington, D.C. Law offices like mine and like Ed's uh, oftentimes have firms that extend beyond uh, a region. So there are there are local firms, there are statewide firms, there are regional firms, there are national, and then there are of course uh, international firms. Some of you may be familiar with what's called the AmLaw 100. This is the ranking of the 100 largest firms in the United States. Uh, I'm not aware if there are any AmLaw 100 firms in Connecticut. But the next tier are what's referred to as the AMLA 200. My firm and Ed's firm fall within uh, what's called the AMLA 200, which would be within the 200 largest firms within the United States. But as I say, there are many, many law firms in Connecticut where lawyers practice by themselves, where lawyers practice in very small groups, in very collegial uh, settings. And it's in a very it's a very attractive way uh, to practice law, although uh, there are at the same time many mid-size and large, including AmLaw 200 law firms practicing law in Connecticut. The next slide, uh, which is slide four, um, provides a little bit of information with respect to the organizational structures. So. A, a, a single lawyer firm would typically be considered a sole proprietorship, but then we also have what we recognize as general partnerships, limited liability partnerships, and uh, in some cases, professional corporations. The last two groups, limited liability partnerships and professional corporations, these are the uh, organizational structures typically used by the larger firms. And whether a firm uh, is a, organized as a general partnership or a limited liability partnership or a professional corporation will usually depend upon several things. First, the size of the firm. Second, how the partners or managers of that firm uh, intend for profits to be shared. What kind of tax treatment they think best suits them under our federal and state tax laws and what steps they want to take in order to limit their liability in the event uh, that something goes wrong, something uh, that we really don't like to talk about, uh, but uh, is necessary uh, as we organize law firms in order to limit liability. The next thing that I would like to discuss really are some of the different management structures. And this is very different. So if we go to the next slide, and I'm, every firm, every firm has its own management structure, and that management structure will be very unique from one firm to the next. Uh, small firms tend to have uh, a very loose or laissez-faire. Uh, management structure, if they have any management structure at all. Uh, other firms, as they get larger, find that they need more uh, organization, more structure uh, in their management. And so as we get an, into the midsize and larger firms, such as my own, such as uh, Ed Heath's firm, 
uh, we're going to find that there is much more management structure. How does that, how, what does that management structure look like? Well, first, um, in, in firms like ours, we have what are called partners. Partners are generally speaking the owners of the firm. Other lawyers in the firm, uh, younger lawyers who have not uh, yet become partners, are considered associates. Uh, those associates and those partners are typically organized in practice areas or what we refer to as practice groups. So you might have a litigation practice group. You might have a corporate transactional practice group. You might have a real estate practice group, a land use practice group. Uh, these are all practice areas where uh, for marketing purposes, but also for a uh, lawyer educational purposes and training, uh, lawyers are grouped or organized uh, to focus in particular uh, specialty areas of the law. That's very common with respect to the larger firms. But you will also find throughout the state of Connecticut general practice firms where lawyers uh, practice in areas that are quite varied so that uh, a lawyer might handle a criminal matter on one day, uh, a personal injury matter the next, and a real estate closing the next, and then perhaps on the fourth day uh, a business transaction or a contract uh, for a business client. That typically happens in uh, smaller uh, firms, in general practice firms, whereas in larger firms we tend to be more focused uh, in part because uh, the area of, of specialization that a lawyer practices in allows that lawyer then to go into the marketplace and uh, to present uh, his or her, her area of uh, specialty, his or her uh, experiences and develop business, which of course is, is very important to all of us. Now, Law firms uh, uh, tend, uh, as they get larger, uh, to have executive committees or management committees where in a partnership such as my own, where in my firm I have over 100 partners, uh, obviously 100 partners can't all be uh, managers of the firm. And so a small select group are elected uh, in order to serve on a management or executive committee and to help with respect to the management function of the firm. Now, everything that I've just described really involves lawyers and the role of lawyers in the law firms. But our law firms in the United States, particularly in Connecticut, and, and particularly in our larger firms, also have non-lawyer administrators and managers. So that my firm, as an example, has a chief executive officer who is not a lawyer, a chief financial uh, officer who is not a lawyer, a chief marketing officer. We have billing staff. Uh, we have collection staff. We have a marketing staff. And we even have a pro bono coordinator who organizes our firm's efforts in providing uh, pro bono legal representation to those in need. The next slide, uh, hiring and recruitment. So this would be slide six. How are lawyers hired? Well, uh, it is quite common for lawyers to be hired directly out of law school. Uh, they will typically, but not always, go to mid-size and larger firms where for the first several years uh, they will get uh, their basic training, if you will. That is the training that uh, uh, really begins to ground them in the practice of law, something that our law schools are not as equipped to do as, of course, the firms are, are able to do. And so they'll get much of their training there. Some of those uh, lawyers hired out of law school will stay with those mid-size and large firms and ultimately become partners. Some will leave to go to smaller firms, perhaps to open up their own offices uh, and to practice either by themselves uh, or together with other lawyers in some of the smaller firms I previously described. Some will go to work uh, for the government. Uh, if I use uh, Justice Dioria as an example, uh, Justice Dioria and I graduated from law school the same year. 
We both went to um, mid-sized or by Connecticut standards at that time, large firms. Um, uh, Justice Dioria was uh, with uh, his firm for uh, quite some period of time before he then went uh, to practice with the Attorney General's office in the state of Connecticut. So he went into uh, the governmental area and from there, of course, ascended to uh, the Supreme Court. Some lawyers will go in-house and work for large corporations or even smaller corporations where businesses have a need for everyday general legal representation. And of course, some will leave the practice of law altogether. The profession is very mobile. But in addition to first year lawyers, it is uh, quite common uh, for laterals to be hired. So laterals would be lawyers at other law firms who have already had their training. Um, perhaps they've already become partners and, uh, and they decide to make a move and go to another firm. That's quite common. Next slide uh, talks a little bit about the lawyer-client relationship. So it is, of course, a fiduciary one. And in the United States, the uh, attorney-client relationship is regarded as the very highest of fiduciary uh, relationships. So a very, very important concept. The lawyer-client uh, relationship requires a written engagement letter. Our rules of professional conduct require that with respect to each engagement of a lawyer by a client, there is a writing, a written letter that, or an email, uh, but something in writing that identifies the client, that identifies the scope of the representation, and that identifies how the lawyer will be paid, the basis or, of, uh, or, or rate of the fee. And so then the last slide, uh, concerns our typical fee arrangements here in the United States. So um, those practicing in the medical malpractice or personal injury uh, fields, the contingency rate fee is uh, very typical. It also can apply in other areas as well, but a contingency fee, uh, which I don't know how common that is in uh, Italy or in Europe generally, but that is where the lawyer is paid a percentage of the ultimate recovery in a matter. Hourly rates are very common, particularly in firms like mine and like in Ed's firm. Uh, hybrid fees, hybrids are a combination of an hourly and a contingent fee, usually a reduced hourly rate uh, together with a percentage uh, of the recovery. Performance-based fees are, are uh, usually a reduced hourly rate together with some sort of a success fee. So the parties, the lawyer and the client, define what will be a successful outcome and then define an appropriate fee on top of a reduced hourly rate uh, to compensate for the lawyer if the lawyer achieves a certain level of success. And then uh, the flat fee is another uh, common uh, fee arrangement. The flat fee, of course, is where the lawyer and the client agree to a lump sum uh, form of compensation uh, for the scope of the rep representation that is defined in the engagement letter. So that's a little bit on the practice of law, the business uh, of law and law firms in the state of Connecticut. And uh, I thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Tom. <laughs> very interesting. Uh, many things come to my mind, but we will talk about it in the next webinar when we'll talk about the Italian point of view on this topic. Uh, now, to stay in the run of show, I introduce uh, Edward Heath. Uh, who cooperated a lot in realizing this project. Edward is a partner with the law firm uh, of Robinson & Co. LLP, which has offices in, in, among other cities, New York, Boston, Hartford, and Philadelphia. Ed leads his firm's business disputes and government enforcement practices. Over the last 20 years, Ed has advised business clients around the world 
on legal matters in the United States. He is also the president of Greater Hartford Legal Aid, an organization dedicated to providing free legal assistance to the poor. Please, Ed. Thank you, Francesco. May we bring up the title slide, please? Yeah, I think. Yes, they are. Okay. They're right. Wonderful. Well, let me begin by expressing my gratitude to President Galetti for inviting me to participate in today's panel discussion. It is an honor and a privilege for me to be here with you, uh, even if it must be virtual. I, I join my colleagues in looking forward to a time when we can all be together in the same room. And I'm particularly interested uh, in us getting the internship, uh, the, the cross country internship off the ground that we've talked about. Now, a significant part of my practice involves assisting clients and lawyers who are based in Europe. It's one of the most enjoyable aspects of my work. And one of the most interesting parts about that is learning about the differences in our respective legal cultures. So with that in mind, I've tried to focus my points today on some of the concepts that differ uh, between the practices in Connecticut and the practices in Italy. And my three topics are on screen now, or were on screen a moment ago, which is legal aid services and pro bono work, uh, two self-represented litigants, and three bar associations. So if we could go to slide two there. So when I talk about legal aid services versus pro bono, I'm really talking about two different concepts. Legal aid services, that is a, a non-governmental organization or a law firm that's operated as a nonprofit where they have lawyers on staff who provide free legal assistance to poor individuals. I contrast that with pro bono service. These, uh, this is lawyers working at private for-profit law firms like my law firm or Tom's uh, or at companies. And we provide free or low cost legal services. We volunteer to provide those services to poor individuals or nonprofit entities. I'll talk about each of these in a little more detail now. If we could go to the next slide, please. So legal aid services are often geographically based, such as being connected to a large city, Hartford, New Haven, New York City, Boston, what have you. But they may also be issue specific. In Connecticut, we have a few issue specific legal aid organizations, such as the Connecticut Veterans Legal Center, which exists to provide pro bono services to military veterans, or the Connecticut Children's Law Center, who provides pro bono services, legal aid services to uh, children in need. And I've selected one example uh, to talk about today, which is very near and dear to my heart, and that is Greater Heart for Legal Aid. As Francesco mentioned, it's an organization of which I'm the president. Now, Greater Hartford Legal Aid was founded over 100 years ago uh, through the work of the Hartford County Bar Association. Its mission is to achieve equal justice for the poor people of Hartford. It's, uh, it's not a large law firm, it's about 22 staff lawyers. That number goes, has gone up and down over the years, um, but, um, but it, it consists mainly of staff lawyers. Uh, but they also work with law firms like Tom's Law Firm and mine to have lawyers who will come in and volunteer for particular projects. Uh, the scope is fairly broad. They handle matters such as housing, such as uh, you know, individuals who are being evicted from their home, education disputes, if, if a child in a public school needs special education benefits, immigration cases, government benefits, uh, family matters, such as divorce and child custody. And another important part of Greater Hartford Legal Aid's mission is domestic violence protection. They will go into court and they will seek orders of protection for victims of domestic violence and matters like these. Now, the types of cases that legal aid organizations don't take on typically fall into the, those that you would expect to be revenue generating uh, for lawyers, uh, such as personal injury claims or disputes between businesses. Legal aid organizations typically only represent individuals, not entities. They also don't handle criminal defense cases typically. And that's because in Connecticut, as in every state in the US, we have what's called public defender programs and those are lawyers at the courthouse, at the criminal courthouses, who provide legal assistance to defendants in criminal cases. 
So those are matters that legal aid typically does not handle. Now, where does the money come from? Uh, well, principally, it comes from the judicial system. A portion of the court filing fees is ultimately set aside and granted to the different legal aid organizations who apply for that assistance. There are also donations that come from private law firms like Tom's firm and mine. Both of our firms are, are major supporters of legal aid organizations in Connecticut. But there are a number of corporations as well that provide assistance. There's also individuals who make donations. And then there are separate federal and state grants, financial grants, money that's given to these organizations. There are a number of federal and state grants, for example, that are available for the domestic violence work that Greater Hartford Legal Aid does that supports its work in this area. But the bottom line to understand is that these are, these are truly law firms, but they only exist to represent poor people and they do not exist to generate any sort of profits whatsoever. Many of the lawyers who work in legal aid organizations dedicate their entire career to this work, never switching over to the, to, to the private for-profit practice of law or going in-house. Next slide, please. So let me now shift to pro bono work. And any discussion of pro bono work, which is the volunteer work by lawyers, must begin with a discussion of Rule 6.1 of the Connecticut Rules of Professional Conduct. Now, the next speakers will address the rules of professional conduct in detail, but just for some context, I'll say now that what we're talking about here are the rules of ethics that govern lawyers in Connecticut. There is a national model rule, a set of rules of ethics, uh, but each state adopts their own. So Rule 6.1 provides that every lawyer has a professional responsibility to provide legal services to those unable to pay, and every lawyer should aspire to render at least 50 hours of pro bono public legal services per year. This is a voluntary and aspirational rule. Failure will not lead to professional discipline. Um, and, and I will tell you that most lawyers do not provide 50 hours of pro bono work a year. Uh, now I can't speak to every lawyer in the state of Connecticut, but I can tell you that at firms like Tom's firm and mine, most lawyers have somewhere between 10 and 30 hours of pro bono work each year. And it doesn't take much for law firms to get volunteers to do this type of pro bono work. And the reason is that we learn its importance in law school. Every law school requires students to take at least one ethics class. And every one of those classes will emphasize the importance of lawyers doing pro bono work and giving back to the community. So when our, our new law school graduates enter the workforce, they have ingrained in them the understanding that it's important to donate and volunteer this time. Um, it becomes part of law firm cultures. Tom referenced the fact that at his firm, they have a pro bono coordinator and a pro bono committee. We have that at Robinson and Cole as well, and most firms do. Uh, it's, it's a committee that's typically made up of, of a cross section of lawyers in the firm from very senior lawyers to very junior lawyers who look for ways to, to find pro bono opportunities for lawyers in the firm. Next slide, please. Now, in most firms, lawyers actually receive a billable hour credit for their, for their pro bono work. Uh, most large firms, for example, in the US have a target number of billable hours that they expect their lawyers to meet. And those lawyers will get hour for hour credit for every hour of pro bono work that they do. And we typically put some type of cap on that at, at our firms, usually 50 or 100 hours or something in that range. But that's a further incentive to lawyers, particularly young lawyers, to know that they're getting credit for that pro bono work. We find that if, uh, when a lawyer starts at our firm, if we strongly encourage him or her to take on a pro bono matter very early on, that it becomes just a, a regular part of their practice for their entire career. Now, the result is that for many firms, we average about two to 3% of our total billable hours on pro bono hours. That's a pretty significant number. At a firm like Tom's or my firm, that can translate into a few million dollars a year of pro bono time that's, that's volunteered. Now, unlike in Italy, there's no compensation received from the government for this work. Uh, it simply comes off the bottom line. But again, realizing how fundamental it is to the practice of law, we lawyers happily do it. Uh, next, next slide, please. Now, the, the, the scope of services that we do as, as pro bono work is very similar to what the legal services organizations do, but it is broader. 
in that it often includes criminal defense work, as well as advising uh, smaller charities and nonprofit organizations. I myself, early in, in my career, did a, a fair amount of criminal defense on a pro bono basis, including a, a murder trial. Um, so it's very common that you get a broad array of experiences as a pro bono lawyer. And these cases may come uh, directly from clients who call up and say that they have a need for legal services. Uh, but oftentimes it comes from the, the referrals come from legal services organizations or from judges or courts. Uh, it's not uncommon for federal judges to reach out to our firm directly or Tom's firm directly and say that they have a particular case in front of them in which the party who's involved very much needs a lawyer and they'll ask us to take those cases on. And as you might imagine, when a judge calls you and asks you to take on a pro bono case, you say yes. Um, now, you may be wondering about the incidents of malpractice, that there are lawyers who are giving their time for free. Will they have the same level of dedication and the same level of effort since they're not being paid? And I'm very pleased to say that the answer is generally yes. There are certainly pro bono cases that have led to malpractice disputes. I can't deny that. But at least in my experience over the last 22 years, I would say that the incidence of malpractice cases around the country is about the same, whether the lawyer is being paid or the lawyer is serving in a pro bono role. Next slide, please. Let me transition to my second topic now, which is pro se litigants. Pro se is obviously Latin for uh, in one's own behalf. Uh, and what it really is, is it's a, it's a fundamental right in the American legal system that an individual may represent themselves in court cases. Um, I understand that is not the case, generally speaking, in Italy. Um, this, this is a right that's existed. It's actually pre, it predates the United States. It's an English law tradition. But it uh, really, it's from the beginning of our country, and it's reflected in a law that was signed by President Washington, our first president. Um, and self-representation is permitted in both criminal cases and civil cases. So an individual may file pleadings in court, may file documents in court. They may make legal arguments to a judge. They may make opening and closing statements to a jury at a trial. And they may examine witnesses in a hearing or in a trial. Next slide, please. Now, there are some limitations on an individual's right to represent themselves. You have to have legal capacity. You must be mentally fit to do this. Uh, and you know, in, in most pro se cases, there's no evaluation of the, the, the self-represented party's mental state. Uh, but when it does come up, judges are not, not shy about examining that. Um, you may also not represent anyone else if you're not a lawyer. You can only represent yourself. Although people try every day to represent others, even though they're not a lawyer. You can't represent family members and businesses cannot have a pro se party. If I own a business, I'm not permitted to represent that business in court because a business is a separate legal entity and I must have a lawyer representing my business. Now, pro se parties are generally given flexibility by judges and understandably so because they're not lawyers. So if, they, if they're a little late in a deadline or they file an incorrect document, they are given some leeway or some latitude. Now, many people decide to proceed pro se because they can't afford a lawyer or they can't qualify and they can't qualify for legal services. But some people decide to represent themselves because they believe that they will get an advantage. They believe they will get sympathy um, from the judge or from the jury, but that's rarely the case. And unfortunately, as you might expect, when a non-lawyer goes into court to, to try their case or argue the merits of their case, it tends to create a significant amount of practical issues due to the fact that this self-represented party doesn't understand the substantive law or the court's procedure. Now, despite all that, there have been plenty of cases in the past where self-represented parties have been successful. There's a famous case involving a, a US a politician, a US congressman, who was prosecuted criminally and prevailed a trial representing himself. And I myself have watched a pro se trial in criminal court where the individual accused represented herself. And at the end of a jury trial, the jury acquitted her, the jury found in her favor. So uh, despite these issues, it is a very vibrant part of our legal culture in the US. Let me go to my final topic now, if you could go to the next slide, please. And that is uh, bar associations. Now, uh, in the US, you have to have a license in order to practice law. 
um, and you get admitted to the bar of a particular state. But the bar itself is not an organization, is not the professional organization through which legal activities happen. Those activities happen through the bar associations. And it's important to understand that bar association membership is optional. Bar associations are private organizations and lawyers are not required to join them. But in reality, most lawyers do join one or more bar associations. And I put on screen examples of, of three major bar associations, the three that you need to know about if you're looking at practicing law in Connecticut. The earliest is the Hartford County Bar Association. And you can see there it was formed in 1783. It was followed by the Connecticut Bar Association and finally by the American Bar Association. And most lawyers in Connecticut are members of the Connecticut Bar Association and the American Bar Association. And most lawyers who practice in the Hartford area are also members of the Hartford County Bar Association, of which Tom Retchen, the prior speaker, is president. If you go to the next screen, please. I've put on screen here the mission of the, uh, the Hartford County Bar Association, and I, I won't read all of these elements to everyone. I think the important thing for you to know if you're considering or, or, or you want to better understand practicing law in Connecticut is to understand that, as I said, most lawyers do join the, their bar associations because they are places through which you can get continuing legal education. They are places through which you can use your law license to find programs to give back to the community. And ultimately, there are ways that you can network, that you can interact and build relationships with lawyers, not only in the county, but in the state, in the region, nationally and internationally. Uh, in fact, it's through the Hartford County Bar Association that I had the privilege of being here with all of you today. And I thank you all for that time. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Ed. Um, we are receiving many questions because uh, we have uh, almost 200 people attending, but hopefully we'll have the time later to answer someone. Otherwise, I say since now that uh, in the next event we'll also face some of the topics that uh, in the question have been highlighted. Now, following our run of show, I want to give the floor to Michael Bowler and Kathleen Harrington who will talk about bar admission and ethics in Connecticut. Let me introduce briefly both of the speakers. Michael Bowler is the statewide bar counsel for Connecticut. He serves as counsel to the statewide grievance committee and the MCLE commission. Attorney Bowler received his JD from the University of Connecticut Law School in 92 and his BA in history from Holy Cross College in 1989. After several years in private practice, Attorney Bowler joined the Statewide Bar Council's office in 1998 as an assistant bar counsel. He became the Statewide, statewide Bar Council in 2004. Kathleen Harrington is a Deputy Director of Attorney Services and oversees all attorney regulations for Connecticut. She has been with the judicial branch since January 2000, and in, in her current role, she spends the majority of her time overseeing the bar admission process, serving as counsel to the Connecticut Bar Examining Committee, and conducting the character and fitness process. Attorney Harrington received her JD from the University of North Dakota School of Law, in 1997 and her BA in criminal justice from the University of Miami in 1993. She is the immediate past chair of the Council of Bar Admission Administrators and serves on the National Conference of Bar Examiners Character and Fitness Investigations Committee. So if you want to be a lawyer in Connecticut, you need the Kathleen approval. So <laughs> I give the floor to Michael and Kathleen. Thank you. Thank you for that welcome, Francesco. It's an honor to be part of this today. And as some of my distinguished previous speakers, I also am proud of my Italian lineage through my maternal grandmother, who is from Aula. Um, so I'm splitting my time with Mike. So I'm going to give you a high level overview of the bar admissions process here in Connecticut. So there are three avenues 
to full admission in Connecticut. And the first would be by taking the bar exam, which that test would be administered over a two day period. The second avenue would be from transferring a score from another jurisdiction if they are administering the uniform bar exam that we administer here in Connecticut. And currently there are 39 jurisdictions in the United States that administer um, the uniform bar exam. And the third avenue would be on motion or without examination, which is also called um, reciprocity. For all three of those avenues, you would a person would have to file uh, the appropriate application that's available online and pay a fee, which would range anywhere from $750 to $1,800 for our different types of admission. The person would be required to submit um, supporting documentation that would vary from their college transcripts, law school transcripts, dean certificates, and depending on their personal situation, they may have to provide uh, criminal records, bankruptcy records, things of that nature. Each person would need to have a law degree, as we call a Juris Doctor degree, from a law school that is approved by the American Bar Association, which is a national entity here, or by the Connecticut Bar Examining Committee, which is the committee I work for. Um, we also do allow petitions for approval of foreign law degrees for individuals that are licensed to practice law in a foreign country, and they must pair that with an LLM, which is an advanced law degree achieved here in the United States. For the first avenue, for if someone wants to take our bar exam, they must achieve a score of at least 266 on that exam. Um, to transfer the score from a different jurisdiction, they likewise have to have achieved a 266 or higher within the previous five years to transfer that score. And for someone who wants to come in on motion, they have to be admitted in a reciprocal jurisdiction, which means that that other jurisdiction would allow admission of our attorneys under similar circumstances. They have to have an intent to actually practice here in Connecticut and they must engage in the practice of law for at least five of the last 10 years. On all three of those avenues, if someone satisfies all of those requirements, the next big hurdle is to pass the character and fitness review. Um, in Connecticut, the burden is on the applicant to show that they have current good moral character and fitness to practice law. We have no um, complete prohibitions. Um, some jurisdictions do, Connecticut does not. What we have are presumptions. For example, if someone has a felony conviction in their past, or if they've been suspended or disbarred in another jurisdiction, under our rules, that creates a presumption that that person does not have the current good moral character and or fitness to practice law. However, it is rebuttable. We allow the applicant an opportunity to provide any evidence that they deem relevant um, to rebut that presumption and to convince the committee that they do in fact have current good moral character and or fitness to practice law. If they meet all of these hurdles, then the person would be recommended for admission and they would take the oath. There are two oaths. There's one as an attorney and then one also as a commissioner of the Superior Court. We do have a few other types of licensure in Connecticut that um, fall short of a full licensure. I'll just mention them briefly since I have such a short time. One is authorized house counsel, and that would be someone who's admitted in another jurisdiction who would be working for a company here in Connecticut. Um, that would be their employer and they would provide legal advice to them. They would register for this certification and therefore would protect themselves against any charge of the unauthorized practice of law here in Connecticut. We also have foreign legal consultant status, which would allow somebody who is licensed in a foreign country to apply and be certified to practice and give advice on the law from their country only while they're here in Connecticut. And then the third type of other licensure is the closest to a full licensure that we have, and that is a military spouse temporary license. And that would allow um, the spouse of a military member here in the United States, if, they, if their spouse was um, deployed and stationed here in Connecticut, to apply and get, I believe it is a three-year temporary license that can be renewed so that they can practice here. Um, and with that, I would like to turn it over to Mike for his portion on ethics in Connecticut. Thank you. Well, uh, good morning. 
Uh, good morning from Connecticut and good afternoon to all of you listening in Italy. And uh, as our other speakers have indicated, I'd like to give my uh, thanks uh, to everyone uh, in Italy for having us here today. Um, as I was introduced, my name is Michael Buller. I'm the statewide bar counsel. And like most of the other speakers here, I trace at least part of my family lineage also to Italy. My grandmother on my father's side, uh, her parents immigrated uh, to uh, the United States and settled in Massachusetts, our state to our north, uh, around the turn of the last, or turn of 1900. Uh, and then my grandmother was born here, but then they all moved back to Italy uh, until they returned a few years later. My grandmother said she had forgotten to speak how, forgotten to speak English uh, and only could speak Italian when she returned to the United States. Um, then my grandmother, who was fully Italian, married my grandfather, who was an Irish police officer, and hence my last name is Bowler, which is Irish in lineage, but I still, I guess, consider myself Italian also. So um, I am the statewide bar counsel. My primary obligation in Connecticut is to serve as counsel to the statewide grievance committee, um, which oversees lawyers who are admitted, as Kathy just uh, uh, told you, in Connecticut. We basically regulate all aspects of uh, attorneys uh, in Connecticut. There are about 40,000 attorneys who are admitted to the bar in the state of Connecticut, although there are only about 35,000 who are active at the current uh, time. Uh, about 20,000 of those lawyers are physically present and practicing in Connecticut. But we are an aging bar. Uh, we currently uh, have a bar that is much older than it is younger. Our bar, uh, I do statistics on the age of the active lawyers in Connecticut on a biennial basis. And when I last did it in 2019, just to give you an understanding, we had 835 lawyers who were in their 20s, and we had over 3,400 lawyers who were active between the ages of 70 and 100. We actually had one active lawyer practicing in Connecticut who was over the age of 100. Generally, the statewide grievance committee to, ha who I am, to which I am counsel uh, processes and adjudicates attorney grievance complaints. A person may file an attorney grievance complaint, complaint when they think that the lawyer involved uh, engaged in uh, unethical conduct. Connecticut lawyers are governed by the rules of ethics. We've seen uh, speakers today show uh, uh, rules in various presentations. One was Rule 1.15, and then we saw the pro bono aspirational rule, Rule 6.1. And those two are two of our uh, many rules of professional conduct, our ethical rules that govern an attorney's conduct in the state. Connecticut, uh, we have no nationwide bar in Connecticut. You have to be admitted to the particular jurisdiction in which you plan to practice. So a Connecticut license will not allow you to practice, for instance, in New York or Massachusetts. It's limited just to Connecticut. So each jurisdiction, including Connecticut, adopts its own ethical rules that govern its bar. And again, Connecticut, like most states, has adopted a set of model rules created by the American Bar Association, a nationwide voluntary bar association. Uh, the model rules were first adopted sometime in the mid 1980s. They've gone through two major revisions since then. Uh, Connecticut in the mid 1980s adopted most of the model rules with some uh, specific changes for Connecticut attorneys. And then as the model rules have gone through changes, uh, first around 2000 and then later uh, in the 2000 teens, uh, Connecticut has slowly adopted some or all of those changes uh, into its set of rules. Our rules went through its ma last major overhaul uh, in 2006 to start in 2007. The rules of professional conduct, our ethical rules, or what our courts have called rules of reason. Uh, and that means that they attempt to reflect what the average attorney would consider a common sense 
ethical approach to practicing. The rules are not meant to be traps for the unwary. They are meant to be common sense, uh, that you should be competent in the, in the field in which you practice. You should advocate strongly for your client. You should keep them reasonably informed about their matter. You should take and hold their funds in as a fiduciary. We, we've talked about that um, when Attorney Retchen was talking about fee agreements. Someone once said that told me that an attorney is one of the few strangers who will you who you will give money to and expect that they will take care of it and not take it for themselves. And in Connecticut, uh, while we have several ethical rules, arguably our most important ethical rule is the rule that requires lawyers who, to take funds from either their client or in certain cases from third parties and to hold it in escrow and to not uh, use or abuse it uh, to bad ends. The rules of practice govern an attorney's, I'm sorry, the rules of ethics govern an attorney's relationship not just with their client, but to third parties, the court, and to the public. And I have limited time and I wanna speak about the unauthorized practice of law for a bit. So I'll only go over some common ethical duties that attorneys owe to their clients. Again, and this is not exhaustive, exhaust, exhaustive in itself. As I mentioned, attorneys owe a duty of competence. They must know what they are doing. They owe a duty of diligence. They must work hard and in a timely manner on their, on their client's case. They owe a duty of communication. They have both a, a, a duty on themselves to keep the lawyer, to keep their client reasonably informed. And they have an obligation to speak to their client when their client needs information. They need to avoid conflicts of interest. And again, we spoke about the lawyer's strong need to maintain a fiduciary responsibility to their client. The overarching principle of attorney ethics, however, whether it be to the client, to the public, to the court, to each other, to third parties, is that they're expected to be honest and forthright in the way that they conduct themselves. There are few ethical violations that will get an attorney in greater trouble than an attorney who lies, whether it is to the court, to their client, or to another party, or to another lawyer in the matter. And while the greatest number of ethics complaints that we get tend to uh, complain that the lawyer hasn't worked hard on the matter or the lawyer hasn't been in touch with the client properly, those diligence and communications rules that I discussed, the, one, the two rules that get lawyers in the most trouble that cause lawyers to be suspended or to lose their license uh, by disbarment are the fiduciary responsibility in other words, the lawyer steals money that has been given to them in trust, or they engage in fraud, dishonesty, or misrepresentation. They lie to the court, to each other, or to their client. Um, I am also in charge of the Minimum Continuing Legal Education Program in Connecticut. Um, lawyers are required on an annual basis to take certain hours of continuing legal education. Uh, that's a relatively new rule in Connecticut, although it is clearly the nationwide trend to require some annual uh, required continuing legal, legal education. We, we require 12 hours in Connecticut, at least two hours of which must be in ethics. And then on the unauthorized practice of law, the basic rule is that with very few exceptions, if you do not have a license to practice in the state of Connecticut, you may not practice law in the state of Connecticut. And we see that happen two different ways. First, we see lawyers practicing in, in Connecticut who are not admitted in Connecticut. So they literally come across the border and try to practice here in Connecticut. Uh, we usually find out because a grievance complaint is filed uh, and then the lawyer is subject to discipline under our ethical rules. There's a specific rule, Rule 5.5. Um, and then there is a, a law, a statute that outlaws it. And then the other way we see the unauthorized practice of law is by non-lawyers who attempt to practice law in Connecticut. Um, both uh, lawyers who are not authorized to practice law in Connecticut and do, non-lawyers who attempt to practice law in Connecticut, and lawyers who are suspended and disbarred but continue to practice even though their license is not active, 
uh, due to disciplinary matters, uh, can run afoul of a law passed by our legislature um, and signed into law by our governor uh, that outlaws uh, the unauthorized practice of law. And in certain cases, the, uh, the violation of that statute uh, can not can be, be considered a felony, and a felony in, in, in our country is, is, is a more serious crime uh, than what we call a misdemeanor. So the unauthorized practice of law by certain individuals uh, can be a felony. It can, it, it can lead to a, a year in prison uh, and a fairly steep fine. Um, I don't have uh, anything more to add today. I do want to thank everyone for having us uh, here as speakers. It's been a, a fascinating uh, 90 minutes uh, listening to everyone speak and, and seeing our, our friends uh, in Rome. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I see that also you have Italian roots and this makes me think that definitely today the Italian heritage in this event is important. And this uh, strengthens our friendship and our cooperation. I quickly give the floor to Councillor Pontecorvo for some concluding remarks. Dear speakers, dear friends who follow this event on the YouTube channel, I can only say that I am extremely happy with the outcome of the meeting. It certainly represents a concrete bridgehead that cements the friendship between American and Italian jurists. The future that awaits us must be one of very close cooperation, and it will be. I want to leave the floor to a high representative of the future of Roman law, uh, lawyer, for the last minute of this conference, the lawyer Mattia Romano, excellence of uh, judicial district, winner of a public competition that has characterized the activity of our bar association for years, uh, and uh, Mattia is uh, accompanied by a colleague, Cristiana Lauri, who also won. With the hope that all of us, our families, our categories, our nations, can come out of this terrible period as soon as possible, returning to be the beacon of the world law in the protection of the fundamental rights of the person. Thank all of you and see you soon. Mattia. Thank you. Distinguished speakers and guests, it has been a pleasure and an honor to join today's event on the behalf of Rome Young Bar Association of the Council of the Bar Association of Rome, with my colleague Cristiana Lauri, fourth secretary of the Rome Young Bar Association. I take this opportunity to thank the speakers, the President Antonino Galletti, the moderator Francesco Salimbeni and the Councillor Andrea Pontecorvo for having involved the Rome Gambar Association into this webinar. Occasions like this give us the opportunity to remember that despite the differences between our legislations, we are all moved by the same passions and ideals. We are all lawyers proud of what we do. As young lawyers, part of the Bar Association of Rome, we will make sure to implement today's learnings and insights in future projects and initiatives. Lastly, I will be delighted as first secretary of the Rome Young Bar Association to work closely with the American colleagues in order to develop further opportunities of cooperation and debate. Thank you very much for the attention. Prego. Okay, we are closing. Okay, we are now closing almost in time. Uh, unfortunately, we have no time for the questions, but I promise the attendance that uh, in next webinar in two weeks uh, we'll uh, also talk about these uh, interesting topics and they highlighted in these questions. So again, thank uh, our president Antonio Galletti, thanks Tom Regent, thanks everybody. And uh, see you on the next meeting in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao a tutti.